If we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out, church. Let's stand together and lift it up. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin. Lost without hope and no place to
37 says to clap your hands, all you people shout into God with a voice of triumph. Amen.
Amen. Amen. He's worthy of that. So glad you're here. You can have a seat for just a minute. No. Huh? Well, over to the left. Okay. Need a photographer? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. So where'd you guys go off to all dressed up this morning? Oh, uh, church. Easter services. How nice. How nice. What did your pastor preach about this morning at this uh, church service? I'm sorry? You know, what was the sermon about? Oh, Jesus. Uh-huh. You know, how he, uh, he, con he conquered death, right? Y you know. Uh-huh. I mean, and he uh, gave us, you know, life? Uh-huh. Abundantly? Huh. Interesting. Very interesting. Hey, you didn't think my wife and I need to hear about that this morning? That wasn't on your radar? No? Say cheese! Good morning, everybody. So as we continue to move forward um, with the service, um, I would like to say a very special welcome to all of our visitors that are here with us in person, as well as ones that are watching online. Um, if you are here with us today, we don't ask that you do anything special, but there is a tear-off section in your bulletin. It's right here on this little flap. Um, if you don't mind, tear that off. Drop that in the offering plate. Uh, give that to one of the staff members. Give it to one of the greeters out front. And we have a special um, gift that we'd like to give for you. Um, also, if you're joining us online for the first time, drop us a comment. Let us know that you're here with us, and we also have a special gift for you as well. Also, while you're flipping through your bulletin, if you see this little insert here, um, it's got some information on it. If you have any other questions about this, um, after service, make your way out to the foyer. Talk to uh, Randy Hora, Rand, excuse me, Randy Hora or Warren Davis, um, and they can give you some more information about that. Um, so at this time, um, if our ushers would come forward uh, to um, give God his tithe and his love offerings. And as they make their way forward, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for bringing us here. Uh, thank you for allowing us to worship you as one body. God, we thank you for everything that you have given us, God. And at this time, as we prepare just to give a little bit of it back to you, God, use this in ways that we can't even understand. Use this beyond Memphis grace, God. Use this to glorify your kingdom. God, bless the gift and the giver. Thank you for everything you've done for us. In your name, amen. As we gather today to give our tithes and offerings, let me tell you about a couple of the things you need to know here at Grace Church. Holy Week has begun, and I, for one, am so thankful. As we celebrate this special time as the people of God, I want to invite you to make additional space for God this week. One way you can do that is by attending our midweek service this Wednesday. Youth, children, and adults will all be together this week as we have a Seder meal together. This is a meal like Christ ate with his disciples. This is a chance for us to experience but this week is all about in a slightly different new way. Through a meal, special opportunities to pray and worship, it'll all be there. If you're planning to attend, make sure to text the number below today to sign up or stop by the foyer and get signed up there too. Either way, make sure to get signed up for this special time of worship that we can join in together. Good morning, Grace Church. I'd like to take just a few moments of your time to give you some information and some details about our kids Easter event which is taking place this Saturday April 16th from 1 to 4. First of all I'd like to say a huge thank you to everybody who has already started helping. Thank you to those who have taken bags of eggs and filled them with candy. Thank you to those who have donated candy and money so that we can buy the supplies that we need. And thank you to those who have already said that they give up a couple hours of their Saturday to come and hang out with a bunch of kids. This is a huge event and it wouldn't be possible without your help. 
So again, thank you so, so much. With that being said, I could still use a little bit more help. I still have some areas where I just need some adult supervision, whether that be standing next to the road to make sure the kids don't get too close while they're looking for eggs or passing out snacks and drinks to kids and to parents. Again, this is a huge event and I need all the help that I can get. So if you're interested or willing, please come talk to me. And the last thing I'd like to say is I need your prayer. Be in prayer for this event. Be, be in prayer that the Easter message is communicated to these kids and to these parents in a way that they can hear it and they can understand it and they can apply it to their life. Be in prayer for the people that you're going to invite, whether that be your friends, your family, your co-workers, your neighbors. Be in prayer for them and join me in covering this event in prayer. Thank you. I know so far the announcements have been really focused on, well, Easter and all that's happening this week. But the good news is that the life of the church goes on all year round. Something else that's coming up is our graduation Sunday for all of our graduating high school seniors, as well as those who have graduated from college and other programs. We want to celebrate all of you who have accomplished something really great. And to do that, we need you to email us. So please email me here so I can get you the details about ways you can participate and ways we want to celebrate you. Keep checking our texting service, Breeze, and social media to stay up to date on everything that's happening in our church. You'll see the things we've already talked about, as well as some other things like these. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Church Universal, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I'm uh, going to paraphrase just a little bit, but the people were waving palm branches and throwing their coats down and shouting Hosanna. And the religious elite said, hey, will you, uh, will you make them pipe down? And Jesus said, if they don't praise me, the rocks will cry out. It's amazing to me, you say, oh, I can't sing. Our tone deaf worship is more precious to God than anything else, that if we don't praise him, the rocks will cry out. Church, you know this one. Let's stand together and lift it up this morning. No.
continue service today. We get to the privilege of joining together in prayer in the presence of a loving God. So I invite you at this time to take a posture of prayer. If that's seated, that's fine. If it's, if it's kneeling, the altars are open and we invite you to come. But at this time, prepare your hearts for prayer. God in heaven, thank you for this day, for the family we gather with, for the presence of our Lord. Lord, as we gather on Palm Sunday, I pray the worship we give brings glory to you, that it comes from a place worship, not of what we want, but of who you are. While the praises of Hosanna died down quickly, years ago when you entered Jerusalem, Lord, we pray today, this week is filled with shouts of praise. Use us to take that word out. Lord, as we gather here, there are many, many needs. And Lord, we pray and ask your intervention because you are the God who is above all challenges and who walks with us through every situation. Lord, this week, move. Let your will be done. For those that are sick, Lord, we pray that you lay a loving hand upon them, that you, you bless the doctors who work with them. For those whose sickness might be less visible, whose hurts are deep. God, we pray you invade that place, that you move with the grace and love and peace that only you give. The Lord, this week is not just a celebration of Holy Week, but it is an experience with a loving God who came on our behalf. Help us to meet those in our communities who need the word of God. Help our lives to be shining examples of who you are and help us to go forth. Be with the church, Lord. As we go through times of transition, let your will be done. While transition is hard, we want nothing else than your will and your way. Help us hold set fast. Help us persevere. Lord, we give this week to you. We give these, this time at the service to you. So break the calluses from our hearts, hear the praises of our lips, and change us today. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen.
merciful, merciful Savior, precious Redeemer and friend. Who could have thought that a lamb could rescue the soul of men? Oh, you rescue the soul. of great speakers, pastors and preachers come and give the word of the Lord to us, and today is no different. Today we have the great honor of having our district superintendent, you know, come and visit. Uh, Pastor Dwight Gunter is coming to share the word of the Lord with us. Will you just give him a word of encouragement, welcome him to the stage, and be grateful it's not me. Thank you, Ian. You have an iPhone and iPad and iBritain, and uh, that works, you know. That works. Well, it's good to be with you today, and uh, thank you for your faithfulness and your, your work as a church. I just, um, I want to encourage you today. I, I want to tell you, first of all, in working with your church board, you have a wonderful church board. I, I hope you guys know that. You really do. 
From the first time I met them, I, I came home and, and I, I told Karen, I said, uh, I said, this, this board is fabulous. This is a great board. God's going to help us through this. This is, this is wonderful. And I shared with the board what, I, what I'll tell you here briefly is that we are, we're not, well, remember the story of Samuel looking for, for the next king. So he goes and goes to the house of Jesse and he sees the first one and he says, hey, this is it. He looks like the last one. You know, tall, big, good looking. And, uh, and the Lord said, nope, that's not him. And they keep going down the list. And finally, Samuel's just puzzled. This is the prophet of God. And he's puzzled. And he goes, you got anybody else? Well, we're at that stage where we're going, you got anybody else, Lord? And God just kind of smiles and said, oh, yeah. You'll meet him soon. <laughs> now, I don't know who that is yet, but God's going to help us, right? I believe that. We can trust the Lord. I'm confident God's going to guide us. So pray. Pray for your church board. Pray for each other. Give. Give generously And uh, in these days. You have some work to do to prepare for your next pastor, and, and you're doing it. You're being led, and you're doing it. And, uh, and so got Randy's project list. Pick a project. I love that, Randy. So pick a project. Just go out and pick one, you know, anyone, pick one. Any, take any card, any card to do. Uh, and, and pastors, when they come, they want to know if the church is committed to ministry. And they want to know if, if the church is committed to making the world different. And you want to let them know we're committed because you are, right? Well, my wife said right. Uh, you are, right? Okay, all right, all right. Just want to make sure you're committed to making the world different. If you are, say amen. Oh, okay, we're getting there. Hopefully by the end of the service, you'll be ready. But, um, but the, the pastors are looking for that. And I know through it all, God is, God's going to help us, right? God's going to help us. Well, you can take your Bible and turn to Genesis chapter 16, and as you're turning, I'll tell you this little story. My son and my brother and I, my son Trey and, and I, went skiing a few years ago in Winter Park, Colorado. I love to ski. I'm a flatlander. I, I grew up in the area of swamps, but the first time I saw the mountains of Colorado and I was on a set of snow skis, I just sat down. I was on top of the mountain. I just sat down. I thought, oh, Lord, I'll never get down this thing. And, uh, and, and all of a sudden, about, about 100 yards down that slope, it got in my blood, and I love it. And so my son and I, were he was in college, and he needed some help uh, kind of figuring out life. And so I said, let's go snow skiing, and we went snow skiing. And we went in this back. If you, if you like to ski, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's a back bowl area where not many people go, and it's just powder, and it's just what it is. It's what it is, and you ski it. So we were skiing down this back bowl, and he was skiing, and I was working at it. And, and we get in the back bowl, and, uh, and I'm tired. And so I decided, you know what, I'm, I'm going to, I need to stop and rest. And so, so we stopped, and it was a beautiful area, the hills, on, mountains on each side, and snow is five feet deep, and we took our skis off, trees all around, we took our skis off, we, we put them in the snow, and we sat back, and we had just this father-son kind of moment. And we're just kind of, I'm catching my breath, you know, it's one of those moments. And, and all of a sudden, on the other side of the mountain behind us, we hear that dreaded, boom! They're blasting for snow avalanche. And I knew it was on another side of a mountain. I, I knew it was back over. But, you know, when you know and then you feel something different. Sometimes, so he, he looks back, and then when he looks at me again, my skis are on. And I go, you do what you want to. I'm gone. <laughs> and uh, pretty soon he came flying by me. Because, see, sometimes you can't just sit there. Sometimes you have to do something. Sometimes you can't just keep it on idle. You can't just keep going through the motions. Sometimes you have to do something. You don't know what it is. My dad used to say to me, he said, well, let's do something. Right or wrong, let's do something. <laughs> and, it's, and it's, you know, sometimes it's the fight or flight response. You have to do something. And as a church, you're in one of those 
transition times between pastors. There's COVID complicates the whole thing, I get it. And, and some of you are feeling like, you know, we just got to do something, right? A am, I, am I on target there? You just, we got to do something. We need to do something. You're feeling the pressure. And then it expands even more. You take it outside of the church and you move to our world. You look at the shape of our world right now, the problems, the circumstances, situations, adversity in our culture, the war, everything else that's going on. It feels like somebody needs to do something. And then you bring it back home personally. And there are things in our lives personally where we're like, you know, I just need, something needs to happen. I need to do something. You ever had times like that? Are you in them? Yeah. Well, that's where the lady is in the story we meet today. Her name is Hagar. It's in Genesis chapter 16. And this story that I'm going to read for you in a moment is about this lady with this interesting name, Hagar. Now, let me give you the context. The main characters in this story are Abraham, Sarah, and Hagar, and of course, God. God should be the main character in all of our stories, amen? So who is Hagar? Well, Hagar is a slave. In fact, she's a slave that actually belongs to Sarah who is, and, and, uh, and Abraham, but particularly to Sarah. She becomes a Abraham's concubine, and some suggest that Pharaoh gave Hagar to Abraham and Sarah when Abraham was in Egypt in Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 is that famous chapter where God calls Abraham to follow him and says, through you, I will bless all the peoples of the earth. And uh, at the time of Genesis 12, God gives Abraham a promise. He says, I will make of you a great nation. And then he says, look at the land around you. To your offspring, I will give this land. But the problem is, Abraham and Sarah are childless. So Abraham decided in Genesis 15, Abraham decided, you know what? God needs a little help keeping his promise. You ever thought that? You ever thought, you know what? I know God made a promise, but he needs a little bit of help. So I'm going to help God keep his promise. Well, so he did that in Genesis chapter 15, and you can read about it, and that's where he chose Eleazar, his chief servant, to, uh, to become his heir, and God said, no, that's not what's going to happen. I made a promise to you, and I will keep my promise to you in my time. And so we don't know how much time passed between Genesis 15 and Genesis 16. We have no idea what length of time. I mean, you can read it from one or the other that fast. But there may have been a lot of time in between. And by the time we get to Genesis 16, uh, Abraham's thinking, I need to help God keep his promise again. And so Sarah, who is really frustrated at not having a child... And she decides, I know what I'm going to do. I have Hagar, who is my servant, my slave, and I am going to give her to Abraham. This is where the Bible is not always G-rated, okay? And so I'm going to give her to Abraham, and since Sarah belongs to me, she has a child, the child will belong to me, and it'll be my child. You, hear, you see her logic? It's totally flawed and broken, but that's her logic. So she did, and he did, and they did, and Hagar found herself expecting a child. Now, this is not a, a plan to partner with God in order to accomplish a great vision. But instead, what they are thinking here, this is an attempt to take control away from God in order to accomplish a personal dream. It's an attempt to accomplish a divine call by way of human ability. But I want to tell you this morning, divine visions and divine goals require divine power. All right? Divine visions and divine goals require divine power. If you can accomplish what you believe to be your goal on your own, then you don't need God. But it's when that God-sized vision takes hold of you that then you realize if God does not work, 
If God does not move, if God does not show up, then this will not happen. This will not be accomplished. Now you're starting in the right territory. And so this really speaks, I believe, to where you are as a church because the temptation is to try to take control of the process in order to find God's leaders for, for your church. What we must do is not take control, but we must partner with God and trust Him in His time because we're looking for His person in His time. Now, the same is true in your life personally and in the challenges you face. You ever get impatient with God? I have to tell you, I do. I'm like, God, what in the world is taking you so long? Have you ever said that to God? I mean, be honest. Have you ever thought about saying it? Have you ever thought about it but been too scared to say it? <laughs> you know, it, it's like, you know, I'll, I'll decide, okay, this is what we need to do, and then I want it already done once I make the decision. Okay, then it needs to be done. All right? That's just the way I roll. And God has this funny way of helping me learn patience. And I don't like it. So, so Hagar, has she responds. Now, Hagar, she's expecting a child. And so she starts to treat Sarah with contempt. If it was a football game, they'd throw a flag for taunting. Sarah's response then was no better than Hagar's response. In fact, it was worse because Sarah was the one with the authority. And by the way, our response as Christ followers to the challenges and the unfairnesses of life tell more about our faith than anything else. You see, it's not always what happens to us that, that indicates our faith. It is how we respond that indicates our faith. Do we trust the Lord? Well, Hagar's taunting and Sarah is ticked. That's the Hebrew word for extremely angry. And Sarah and Abraham begin to dehumanize Hagar and start referring to her as that slave girl. And Sarah finally says, something has to be done. So Abraham tells Sarah, you do what you want to do. She, she, he, she chose fight and he chose flight. And so consequently, Sarah deals harshly with Hagar. She, and, and that's what the word says. And in fact, the, the word means looking down on, condescending, treating her with contempt, put her down, made her life miserable, marginalized her, made her feel like nothing, like a nobody, like dirt. And Hagar chose flight. And she said, I'm gone. I can't just keep sitting here. I've got to do something. If she had been in Colorado, she'd have put on her skis and she'd have gone down the mountain. So now we're at Genesis 16. Hear the word of the Lord. Beginning in verse 7. The angel of the Lord found her, talking about Hagar, by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said to Hagar, slave girl of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am running away from my mistress Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will so greatly multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Now you have conceived and shall bear a son, and you shall call him Ishmael, for the Lord has given heed to your affliction. So she named the Lord who spoke to her, You are El Roy, for she said, have I really seen God and remained alive after seeing him? Therefore, the well was called Bir Laha Roy, and it lies between Kadesh and Bered. Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. This is the word of the Lord. And we respond by saying, thanks be to God. Now look at Hagar. Don't, don't, make, don't, don't form any judgments about whether or not she got what she deserved. That's not the issue at all. 
She was marginalized. She was a slave, used to probably the palaces of Egypt, and now she ends up in the tents of, mo uh, of nomads. She's mistreated. She suffered injustice. She's helpless. She's hopeless. She was in a situation over which she had no control. She simply had to do something. And so she runs and she finds herself in a wilderness. A wilderness is about isolation. A wilderness is about no resources. Wilderness is like the end of the road and then some. It's like when, you, when the dirt road becomes a path and then the path disappears, then you're in the wilderness. And, and so Hagar is running away into the wilderness of Shur. And when the wilderness looks better than your current location, you know you're in trouble. When a bleak future appears to be better alternative than the abominable present, you know you are in trouble. So unpack the story for just a moment. An angel of the Lord shows up and speaks to her. He calls her by name, Hagar. Remember, for a while now, she was referred to as that slave girl, nameless. Uh, years ago, an elderly gentleman who joined our church staff when I was pastoring in Texas, he, he became my hero. He was 80 when he joined our staff. I was like 35 years old. He joined our staff, and he said, Now, Dwight, I, I need you to do something for me. I said, What's that, Pastor Earl? He said, Teach me how to use a computer. I said, I love you. I, I said, I want to be just like you when I grow up. And uh, he rode horses and drove an MGB convertible and learned to use a computer at age 80. I said, now that's my hero right there, right there. But he said to me one day, he said, people like the sound of their own name. And I've never forgotten that. And he said, and so this angel shows up, and this angel calls her by name, Hagar. She was not a nameless, forgotten person with God. God knew her name. God called attention to the issue. You are a slave girl of Sarah. I, I, God asked questions and made statements that brought her face to face with her reality. Listen, we cannot get past our present struggles without facing present realities. You see, if you want to get into the future, you have to face where you are right now. Where am I right now? You have to name the present right now. And then you can begin to map the way. You ever tried to get directions and you didn't know where you were? You can't get there if you don't know where you are. You got to know where you are before you can figure out a way to get to where you want to be, right? And so we can't get past the present struggle. So what the angel does is the angel says... You are a slave girl. Yes, that's true. Now I want you to return to Sarah and submit to her. And this seems to be the very response Hagar would not want to hear. She's been used and abused. She has no future there. She suffered there. But there is where God wanted her to be. As a district superintendent, I wish I could have walked in here in the first meeting and said, tell you what, let's talk, let's listen, okay, boom, I have a pastor for you, and the next week you'd have had a pastor. But that isn't where God wants us to be. There, here, is where God wants us to be. Now, what is he going to do about it? Once we understand where we are, then he's going to lead us to where he wants us to go, Right? But we have to look at present, we have to look at present realities. So the amazing thing to me is that Hagar didn't turn around and argue with God. Hagar actually obeyed and returned to Sarah and Abraham. Now that's the story, and I'm trying to stick to it, and I'm not going to take you forever here, but I want you to see something here. How does God help us in our wilderness? in our present situation, when you just have to do something. How does God help us? So look at this. The key to unlocking the story is in four verbs. You ready? Here's the first one. I'll give them to you quickly. Here's the first one. It's in verse 7. It's the word found. 
when God found Hagar in her wilderness. She was in the depths of despair. She was running away. She wanted to get away from it all. She was helpless. She was hopeless. She was humiliated. But God found her. Now, I, I, I want you to hear that. There is a God who finds us. Do you remember when God found you? I remember where I was. I grew up in church. All right, I was a preacher's kid. I went to the altar every time I thought I was going to get a spanking for misbehaving in church. I thought, well, maybe that'll soften my dad's heart. It didn't. And uh, you repented, God forgave you, but I'm about to exact some punishment here to help your memory, your memory here. And, 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 you know, but it's, but I remember the night when God found me. He found me. And I remember the bondage I was in and God found me. We have a God who finds us no matter how far we run, no matter where we're running, no matter what we're doing. God finds us. We can run to the wilderness, which is at the end of the paved road and the dirt road and the path in the middle of nowhere with no resources, and God finds us. Has God found you today? I want you to understand this morning, church, God has found Grace Church of the Nazarene. God knows where you are. He has found you. Look at the next word. It is heard in verse 11. God has heard you. It means, it means not just hear a sound in your subconscious. It means listen to, paid attention to. God has really listened to you, Hagar. And the angel instructed Hagar to actually name her son Ishmael, which means God hears. Because for the rest of her life, every time she was found herself in a wilderness or in a difficult situation... She would call the name of her son Ishmael and be reminded that she has a God who really hears her. Hears her. Listen, there is a God who hears us. No, ma no matter how much life has muffled our cries, no matter how isolated we feel, no matter how hot and dry or lonely our wilderness may seem, God hears hears us. Amen? There's an old question raised by philosophers. If a tree falls in the woods and there's no one there to hear it, does it make a sound? Anybody remember that question from school? You remember that? I, I like the other version of it, and that is, if a man speaks in the woods and there's no woman there to hear it, is he still wrong? I, I, I like that version of it, but, but I, I, I'm, I'm not going there this morning. Those two things are Fairly irrelevant. But his, here's what is relevant. God hears you. You wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like you have hardly been asleep because of the situation on your mind. And when you wake up, it's right there and you pray. You know what I'm talking about? God hears you. God hears you. I think God even hears the, the beat of your heart when you're stressed and you're under the, the gun, so to speak. You're, 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 you're there, the pressure is on, and maybe the situation is not at the forefront of your mind, but your body knows and your, your subconscious knows and it's there. I think God hears the heartbeat. God hears you. Look at the next word, sees. Verse 13. There was a powerful, life transforming realization that came to Hagar. You see it in the text. You just have to almost hear it with its emotion. God is a God who sees us. In fact, in verse 13, she, she named the Lord 
El Roy, which was common in the Old Testament. Every time they'd have an experience with God, they'd give God a new name based on that experience. And, and so, so it's like, this is El Roy. This is the God who sees. In fact, she says, have I really seen the God, seen God and remained alive after seeing him? And, and I love the way the New International Version translates it. it. It says her words, I have now seen the one who sees me. There is a God who sees us. No matter what mountain we're behind or what rock we're under, no matter how huge our circumstances may seem, no matter how overwhelming our situation may feel, no matter if we feel like we've already gone under the waves, God sees us. We have a God who is not remote in some faraway place who, has, who can't see us. Instead, we have a God who hears us, who listens to us, who finds us, and who sees us. But wait, there's more. This little verb, don't miss it. It's the word multiplies. The, it's verse 10. The angel of the Lord said to her, I will so greatly, you see the word, multiply your offspring that they cannot be counted for multitude. In other words, it's bigger than a multitude. You know what this is about? This is about a future. Your descendants, your offspring, it's about a future. And God is telling her, Hagar, you who are running away, you find yourself in the wilderness right now, you don't even feel like you have a future. You don't feel like you have a chance. You're just trying to survive one day at a time. This is it. But God, who has found you and heard you and sees you, this God has a future for you. It is a future that is so abundant and so great you can't even count it. It is multitude upon multitude. I mean, you can't, even, you can't even put a number on it. There is a God, in other words, who gives us a future. No matter what our past has been, no matter what our situation is currently, no matter what our predicament may be, no matter our background or our status, it, it, is, it does not matter to God. God gives us us a future thanks be to God and I want to tell you church there's a future for you there's a future for you God's not done with you God is God is is at work God has a future for you in fact God might just be getting started you see Hagar was expecting she hadn't birthed Ishmael yet and God's talking about multitude of offspring. Sounds to me like God's on the front end of this thing. He's it's just getting started. And notice, God didn't deliver Hagar from the circumstances of her life, but he did empower her to live with meaning and purpose in the middle of it. So what do you do in the meantime? In the meantime, you go to work. You work on the kingdom. You build a kingdom. And what's going to happen when you get a pastor? You don't quit and go, whew, man, am I glad you're here. We're done our job. We're through now. No, no. You go to work and you keep advancing the kingdom of God. Why? Because your best days are in front of you, not behind you. Well, I look at this story. There's even more. I, I, I know I, I'm, I need to stop here in a minute and I'm going to, I promise. But remember where Hagar was? She was in the wilderness of Shur. If you were to read on to Genesis 21, you'll find her on the run again. She's in the same basic wilderness, but this time she has her son Ishmael with her. And she's hot and tired and thirsty to the point of death. She's at a rope's end once again. She takes her son Ishmael, the young boy, and she puts him off to the side. She says, I can't bear to watch him die. And she goes over and sits down and in 21 chapter 21 verse 17 and God heard the voice of the boy and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her what troubled you Hagar do not be afraid for God has heard 
the God who hears, the voice of the boy where he is. Come lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand. I will make a great nation of him. And then God opened her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. She cannot bear to see, but God sees what we cannot bear to see. And God does what we cannot do. And God's promises for a future and even our later discouragement will not prevent God from his future. God finds us. He hears us. He sees us. He provides for us. But wait, there's more. If you fast forward a few hundred years, you'll find that Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And they get to the wilderness of Shur, this same wilderness. And they are complaining because the water at the spring where they find themselves is bitter. And they're complaining against God and they're whining. Y'all never do that. Do you? You never do that. They're doing that. They're whining. They're complaining. They're in the wilderness of Shur. And what does God tell Moses to do? Cut this piece of wood, throw it in there, and let the water become sweet. God finds us. God sees us. God hears us. God provides a future for us. Oh, but on this Palm Sunday, there's even more to this story. You see, Israel was in a wilderness of sorts. It was in the days of Jesus. It was in the days when Rome ruled and they were in a wilderness. In fact, theologians will tell you that Israel still believed themselves to be in exile. And what happened? God heard them. And God saw them. God found them. And God came to them. It wasn't what they were expecting. They didn't... Hagar didn't expect a well in the middle of the wilderness. Hagar didn't expect to meet the angel of the Lord in the wilderness. Israel didn't expect to have just a simple piece of wood thrown into a spring and all of a sudden everybody drank fresh water. It wasn't what they were expecting, but it was what God had in mind all along. Because you see, in every one of those stories, what happens is this. God shows up. God, that we often think is remote and removed, becomes this present God. And so God himself, Jesus is the Trinity in the flesh, and God himself rode into the city of Jerusalem, and God himself picked up that cross and bore the sins of the world so that you and I would have life. And so as I wrap it up this morning, I, I, I want you to understand something, Grace Church, that God has heard you, God has found you, God sees you, and God has a future for you. And I don't know what situation you are facing in your life right now, what it is that wakes you up at night, but I want you to understand God has found you. He sees you. He hears you. He provides for you. This God has come to you right now. He is present among us. 